Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi dan salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. A very good morning and welcome to our Green Campus Universitas Indonesia. His Excellency Robert Blake, the Ambassador of the United States of America to Indonesia, the Director of App America, Mr. John Choi, Acting Rector of Universitas Indonesia, Professor Bamba Wibawarta, Secretary University of Universitas Indonesia, Professor Tommy Ilyas, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities of Universitas Indonesia, Dr. Adriano Suwaruntu, Vice Dean of the Faculty of Economy, Dr. Vita Silvira, Vice Dean of the Faculty of Pharmacy, Dr. Ari Yenwa, the Head of the University Library, uh, Dr. Fuad Ghani, and the Head of the American Studies Program, Dr. Irit Adus, the Head of American Studies Research Center Program, uh, Dr. Susi Sudarman, Research Manager of the Postgraduate Program of Universitas Indonesia, Dr. Anissa Santoso, our distinguished professors uh, from different faculties and also the Postgraduate Program of the American Studies Center, uh, our beloved uh, distinguished friends, uh, students, and also professors and lecturers of Universitas Indonesia. Uh, good morning and welcome to our Green Campus and we are delighted today to have uh, Ambassador Robert Blake with us uh, to give a public lecture on the title of the future of our bilateral relationship. Uh, my name is Joe Dawid Abdabutri, I'm lecturer of international relations at the University of Indonesia and also the chair of today's organizing committee. And it is very interesting that uh, Ambassador Blake chose the word our uh, bilateral relationship and not US-Indonesia bilateral relationship. In the language of diplomacy sometimes, uh, the language and the choice of wording is very important uh, because our means probably a close relation and also for the details we'll just wait for Ambassador Blake to explain his lectures. So to just give a brief overview about our one and a half hours event today, first of all, uh, for those of our other friends, because the limitation of space, which actually cannot uh, come in person to today's event, we have a live streaming, which can be accessed at our university website, uh, www.ui.ac.id. So actually, even our friends in the United States can also uh, hear you speak in our beautiful campus. And uh, first of all, of course, uh, later on, we'll invite our acting directors to deliver the welcoming remarks. And then afterwards, Ambassador Blake will give around 20 minutes of remarks in English, which will be moderated by uh, Dr. Susi Sudarman. And afterwards, we'll, of course, we'll give uh, the floor to our friends and students and also professor who is attending today for question and answers. And the best uh, 10 people who raise their question will be given a token of appreciation or door prize a small sort of appreciation from at America. And then, of course, our acting director will present a token of appreciation and certificate of collaboration for Ambassador Blake. And then follow the session and we will conclude the sessions. So without further ado, we would like to invite Professor Bambang Vivawarta as the acting director of the University of Indonesia to go to the session. Over 
even in the Ukraine, also attended by your counterpart from the Russian Federation and the Ukraine. And not all Americans are regular visitors on our campus here. And when the first Indonesia gave President Barack Obama a warm welcome that he delivered while the wedding speech on U.S. Indonesia division on our campus on November 10, uh, 2010. And then, an ambassador, Sir Excellency Scott Marshall, delivered his public lecture here on the topics of education and the comprehensive partnership. In one last year, Her Excellency Christian Bauer, your deputy chief of mission, also gave a public lecture here on the subject of the U.S. Parliamentary. Those of our research on demonstration and understanding on working to strengthen the relationship have featured strongly in this visit. And on the first Indonesia, the police force is a strike to make a contribution to further understanding and bring our children to this. In education, we provide undergraduate courses on U.S. history, the levels of humanities, history of uh, history studies program. And we also provide postgraduate uh, courses on U.S. and our American studies program here in the world to see uh, in our postgraduate program in Zion. And this university provides the opportunity to study uh, the U.S. initial relationship in terms of trade, politics, education, and culture. We have also been working with partner U.S. University on student exchange and also um, a coaching effort exchange to Russia. So that looks at the role of multiculturalism and multi-faith approaches to the democracy. This excellent program allows students to stay in the cities in the U.S. and Indonesia, hosted by the Department of Institution, and provides excellent access to people and institutions to facilitate discussion and growth horizon. Consider the importance of the U.S. and Indonesian strategic partnership. It started by President Barack Obama and President Yudhoyono, and now we have taken our new president, Jokowi, we are ready to play our part to publicly extend existing cooperation in areas of higher education that can help to strengthen Indonesia-US relation. But I'm sure that everyone is eager to hear your speech, for instance, and I will perform and the floor over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bamba Mimawarta, for that great remarks. And for the next session, uh, because time is very limited, so we'll invite Dr. Sisi Sudarman to please have the floor, and also Ambassador Robert Blake uh, to please come forward. So you can see our beautiful student who is eager to hear you speak today. And first of all, Dr. Sisi Sudarman will introduce uh, Ambassador Robert Blake. Resolution of 
South China Sea disputes in accord with international law. Uh, but most important of all for Indonesia, in U.S. assistance to Indonesia, first, that which concerns the Indian Chinese Cooperation Compact Funds that began in April 2013, and secondly, for most of the programs that relate to the U.S. Indonesia Comprehensive Partnership. This partnership covers several priority areas such as trade and investment, education, energy, climate change, and the environment, security, democracy, and civil society. This is essentially a framework that commits the U.S. and Indonesia publicly to developing the relationship, consistent cooperation on common interests, has the potential to transform the U.S.-Indonesia relationship, but there are apparent limitations on the U.S.-Indonesia relationship that will take time to navigate differences in priority and political context, apart from the natural differences between the, whole, the way a rich country and a middle income country see the world. Uh, we are pleased to welcome His Excellency, the U.S. Ambassador to Robert Blake, to the Deliver His Public Lecture, followed by question and answer session in the after. Uh, I should introduce you, first of all, Ambassador uh, Blake uh, arrived in Indonesia on November 21st, 2013, in Jakarta and presented his credentials to President Yudhoyono on January 20th, 2014. Previously, Ambassador Blake served as Assistant Secretary of State of South and Central Asian Affairs from 2009 to 2013. He also served as Ambassador to the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka and the Republic of Maldives from 2006-2009. Prior to that, Ambassador Blake served in India, Tunisia, Nigeria, Egypt, in Nigeria, as well as holding several positions at the State Department in Washington, D.C. He received a BA from Harvard College and an MA from my school, the Downs Hopkins School of Advanced Sessions. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs>
specifically how the United States intends to work with President Joe Biden's administration to further develop our bilateral partnership. And I'm certainly not able to speak on behalf of the Indonesian government, but I'm happy to speak about what we have accomplished together over the past several years, and then highlight areas where we hope to collaborate in the future. And I'm going to change things a little bit. Uh, rather than just give you a kind of long list of things of where we, where we cooperate, I'm going to give you a top ten list. Maybe, maybe, maybe many of you may be familiar with David Letterman. David Letterman is a very famous comedian. He loves to give top ten lists. This is, this, is not a, this is not a copy of it, but it is a part of the top ten format. And I'm going to give you the top ten reasons why the future of our bilateral relationship is very strong and one of optimism. And so let me just go through them quickly now. The first, and perhaps most, in many ways most important, is the shared democratic values that the United States and Indonesia have. We are the world's second and third largest democracies. We are a very large country who believe in the same form of government and value diversity first. The strength of our political systems is proof that democratic norms and values are universal and not dependent on culture, history, or religion. And because we have these common values, we can face the future confident that our two countries will continue to broaden and improve our relations, not just with each other, but with countries around the world. These shared values are more important than ever that the United States and Indonesia each play important roles in confronting ISIL in the Middle East. It is critical that government and civil society leaders of the world's largest Muslim-majority democracy have rejected ISIL's violent ideology. And Indonesia's own transition to a thriving democracy and market economy that offer a future of opportunity and hope for your young people are also a very valuable example for the countries of the Middle East to emulate as they grapple with the challenges of extremism and despair. A second reason for optimism is our growing political and security cooperation. As our two countries strengthen our democracies, promote good governance, promote and defend human rights, and, and support stability and prosperity throughout the region. The United States and Indonesia increasingly cooperate on security and defense goals. We are working, for example, with the Indonesian military to improve maritime security, strengthen international peacekeeping operations, help respond to disasters, and address transnational security challenges that impact the entire region, such as smuggling and drug traffic. As a result, our defense and security cooperation have never been better. We stand ready to bolster maritime cooperation to complement the vision that President Joko Rui has laid out. We are also very proud to be Indonesia's top partner in the number of bilateral exercises and other engagements that Indonesia has each year. We are pleased to play a role in supporting Indonesia's military modernization, including through the provision of world-class American military systems and technology. For example, Indonesia is one of the less than 15 countries around the world to which the United States has agreed to sell Apache attack helicopters. We're also partnering with Indonesia on addressing global security challenges such as terrorism and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Through partnerships with law enforcement agencies throughout the region, we're working hard to protect our people and our world from those that would do us harm. Last week when our two presidents met in Beijing, President Obama called President Joe Biden. I want to thank Indonesia for the work that it has done to isolate extremism and to work with other countries on counter terrorism efforts. A third reason for optimism 
is our cooperation on governance and civil society. As this interest exercises an increasingly influential role in the world today, one of its strengths is its active civil society, with whom my government and our own civil society cooperate to promote such things as interfaith dialogue, women's economic and political empowerment, and exchanges on things like media, rule of law, and parliamentary and electoral processes. For example, last week at America, we hosted a talk show with Indonesian American Imam Shamsi Ali and his friend, Rabbi Mark Schneider. They are both respected religious leaders in the United States, one who is Muslim and one who is Jewish. They talked about their friendship and their work promoting interfaith dialogue in New York and around the world. And before the event, they met with Vice President Powell, who was intrigued by their efforts to build bridges of understanding. To share such experiences more widely, our two countries negotiated last year a memorandum of understanding on South-South triangular cooperation that will enhance our ability to work together in third countries like Myanmar and Egypt to help them to build their capabilities to improve their governance and promote democracy. Reason number four of options is the growing trade and investment cooperation between the United States and India. Through our comprehensive partnership, we are cooperating now bilaterally, regionally, and globally to promote economic growth, sustainable development, and poverty alleviation. And one of the ways that we can do all of this by supporting an open and transparent rules-based international trade system. The United States has supported greater Indonesian participation in global bodies like the G20, which took place last weekend. And we seek to reduce barriers to trade and investment through mechanisms such as our trade and investment working group. Despite recent double-digit growth in our trade, we still have a long way to go. Indonesia is currently only our 34th largest trading partner. So we welcome Indonesia's initiative to establish a U.S.-Indonesia Business Council based in Washington, D.C. And we have held many workshops to help support the development of small and medium enterprises. U.S. support has helped Indonesian companies to buy 200 new airplanes for companies like Lion Air and Peru to service Indonesia's growing demand for air travel. We've also helped to finance 100 new locomotives that will serve Indonesian rail companies and help President Jokowi's vision of improving transportation infrastructure. And most of all, Indonesia's future economic promise and its growing middle class are expected to offer American companies significant opportunities for expansion for many, many years to come. Reason five for optimism is maritime cooperation. President Jokowi has prioritized the development of a maritime axis to raise income and integration across the Indonesian archipelago by improving Indonesia's maritime infrastructure and transportation capacity. We have a strong partnership with the Indonesian government on marine issues to build on. The U.S. Agency for International Development is designing a new $33 million program that will support the conservation of marine biodiversity, promote sustainable fisheries management, and improve the governance of marine resources at local, district, provincial, and national levels. The U.S. Department of Justice has a long track record working to build Indonesia's maritime security capacity in areas such as illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. And the Department of Justice is gearing up its work to focus on the identification and prosecution of those involved in illegal fishing as part of broader efforts to combat transnational organizing. 
American companies like Mars and Nova are leading the charge to develop alternative, more sustainable livelihoods in fishing communities across Indonesia. Likewise, American universities like the University of Rhode Island and research institutions like San Diego Scripps Oceanographic Institute are partnering with Indonesian universities and government agencies to conduct important research in the Indonesian maritime diversity and fish science. Reason number six for our environmental cooperation. The efforts that I just mentioned in turn dovetail with the success that we have had working together on our shared environmental protection and climate change agenda. On climate change, Indonesia and the United States are working closely to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. With U.S. government entities contributing about $500 million toward our bilateral low emission development strategy. It is vital that both of our countries work together to develop nationally determined greenhouse gas emission reduction targets and strategies ahead of next year's important UN Climate Summit. To help that goal, we have negotiated two Death for Nature swaps in which the United States has forgiven over $50 million in Indonesian debt in exchange for Indonesian commitments to protect forest areas and reduce deforestation. And I'm happy to say that we've just finished a $12 million extension of this program that will help to preserve additional biodiversity-rich land in Sumatra. The Millennium Challenge Corporation, a USG-funded independent development agency, has committed $332 million to support what's called the Green Prosperity Project that aims to promote renewable energy, sustainable land use, and forest management projects. We are working with the government of Indonesia, the private sector, and other governments to develop tools to promote renewable energy and energy self-sufficiency. The United States is also a large and growing market for Indonesia's crude palm oil, and we strongly support the effort that Kata has made to broker an agreement with Indonesia's largest palm oil suppliers to stop planting on high carbon stock forests and peatland. And we are also cooperating with the Indonesian government and NGO partners to combat wildlife traffic. Reason number seven for optimism is our joint efforts on energy cooperation. To sustain our economies, we need more sustainable and renewable energy. We are working together to promote clean energy, technology, and policy both to bolster Indonesia's energy security, but also to help reduce greenhouse gases. U.S. businesses support the development of geothermal and clean energy resources and the delivery of power to remote areas, another high priority for President Jeffrey. We're also working to help Indonesia attract more investment in the oil and black gas sector. In the last year, we welcomed two major clean energy investments. One by Ormont Technologies and the other by PT Geo Pacific, who are both taking a majority stake in a $250 million geothermal power generation project. And another very important project is the development of revolutionary zinc air battery technology by a U.S. company called Fluidic Energy, which just entered into a contract for $79 with Indosat. These collaborations will help our two countries to develop and sustain cleaner energy options well into the future that will help our people and the health of our planet. Reason number eight, which will be a great interest to all of you, is education cooperation. The future of our bilateral relationship depends on many factors, but perhaps none is more important than our cooperation between our teachers and our students. 
Education is a key variable that will shape our relationship, train our young people, and determine the future competitiveness of our economy. Our education working group is expanding the opportunities for Indonesians to do research in the United States and for more Americans to come here. And we are taking a lot of steps to improve that collaboration. I know that the University of Indonesia, for example, is doing its part with collaboration with UC Berkeley and Columbia University. There are many, many Americans who study, teach, and conduct research here in Indonesia. And we have increased exchanges, witnessing a steady increase in the number of Indonesians studying in the United States and the number of Americans who are coming here. But we hope to see much greater growth in the future because people with people contacts are thriving. Our Fulbright program, for example, is among the largest in the world. The return of the Peace Corps volunteers who teach English in Indonesia in 2010 is a further sign of our commitment in the education system and to people with people's eyes. There are currently 89 Peace Corps volunteers throughout Indonesia teaching English in high schools and junior high schools. We also have 16 English language fellows who train teachers and improve curriculum at universities and 40 full bright English language teaching assistants who help teach English in some of the Indonesia's more remote areas. We're always looking for ways to promote technical and vocational education that will help Indonesia build the skills they need to compete in the modern economy. Last year, almost 8,000 Indonesians studied in the United States. That is welcome, but small for a, for a country the size of Indonesia. There are many, many opportunities to study in the United States, and I want to invite all of you who are watching today to consider pursuing an advanced degree in the United States, because we offer the best combination of quality, value, and diversity in the world. According to a survey of U.S. colleges conducted by the Nonprofit Institute of International Education, the U.S. once again is far away from the top destination for foreign university students. The number of international students in U.S. colleges and universities increased last year about 8% to nearly 886,000 students. China sent the largest group with 274 <coughs> very large and impressive So for more information about universities and scholarships, I encourage you to check our embassy website or to stop by at America and Pacific Place Mall. We have a full-time education advisor who is there whose job it is to help you figure out how to study in the United States and what are the best options for you. This Saturday, for example, at 1.30, we are hosting a special at America Education is for everyone. So please come to learn more about universities and scholarships. Reason number nine for optimism is our collaboration on health, science, and technology. Some of our educational partnerships have catalyzed the important work the U.S. and Indonesia are doing together on important health issues, whether bringing clean water and sanitation to poor areas working through our Centers for Disease Control with Indonesian counterparts at the Ministry of Health to combat malaria, tuberculosis, and infectious diseases, or spending over $170 million on U.S. programs to improve mother, infant, mortality rates in Indonesia to combat sunscreen. That record is good, but we are not satisfied. Through USAID, we're working with the Indonesian government to increase the number of educational and research exchange programs, especially in science and technology, with the goal of supporting innovation here in Indonesia. And we're also working with the Indonesian to find ways to use that research well in support of the government policy. Reason number 10, the last week for optimism in our relationship is social media. We both love social media, a lot. 
when Facebook co-founder Mark Zuckerberg visited Indonesia last month. President Joe Biden took him on a blue top walk with not a lot And they were loud, like rock stars that they are. And it's no wonder. Indonesians and Americans love social media. And it's potential to bring innovation and collaboration to our country. I know as students, a lot of you are on path when you're at the lovely little cafe that I just went by. You're on Facebook when you're at school. You're on Instagram when you're hanging out with your friends and snapping selfies. <laughs> and you're on Twitter when you're stuck in my head. <laughs> so you must be on Twitter a lot, as I know I am. <laughs> Social media is about collaborative power. And that's what's so democratic and so liberating about it. Facebook and Twitter help us to connect to each other, to our friends, to our families, and to our colleagues. And social media helps connect our two countries in ways that we could have never imagined even five or ten years ago. Social media makes our big world smaller by empowering to express and implement people's innovative ideas. Take, for example, Check to Bowl, School Check. This pilot project is taking place in 15 schools in Semarang, Kalankaraya, and Makassar. It's a website, SMS, and email platform where students, teachers, and parents submit suggestions to improve their school performance. Schools are required to respond to suggestions within 10 days. And it is improved transparency and increased accountability. So schools now are more open and transparent about their budget and their management. It has also encouraged students, teachers, and parents in these cities to be more active participants in their schools, and the technology continues to serve as a communication bridge between them. So in closing, I know that the future of our bilateral relationship will only get better because of the potential of our leaders, citizens, but particularly our youth. And no one is more important than all of you in this room, the future leaders of this great country. I want you to know that we believe in you. We believe in your ability. We believe in the promise of what you can do in our open, thriving, democratic country. We look to you serve as bridges of understanding and collaboration between our two countries. And through our comprehensive partnership, we are now laying the groundwork for the future. It's not always easy. It's hard work. But I know our work will bring our two countries closer together and help our country become more prosperous, more sustainable, and more democratic. So thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity today. And I look forward to hearing your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I think you've put your speeches easy enough to understand. Thank you. Yeah. Important points. Yeah. Uh, so we could revolve around your questions on these 10 important points because uh, I think you have to like to hear um, voices from the because we really believe in you. So let me start to open this discussion. Uh, maybe three people for the first time. Uh, awesome. Okay, just see your name and your question, period, so that you can ask. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Tanya. I'm a proud graduate of the American Studies in Universitas of Indonesia. And I'm currently serving as the Assistant Deputy Director at the uh, Director of North and Central America at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So, uh, yes, uh, as you mentioned uh, before, Your Excellency, that uh, Mr. President Obama has stated to our President Jokowi that uh, he thanks Indonesia to isolate uh, 
uh, extremisms. And we know that Indonesia and the United States have taken a different approach in tackling the ISIS. Uh, where the uh, U.S. is inclined to a more hard approach and Indonesia is known to, um, to introduce the deradicalization or integrating the so-called terrorists to the society. I would like to know, maybe you could kindly elaborate further, how the U.S. and Indonesia can bridge this kind of approaches to tackle the, to, or to eradicate the terrorism challenges in our future bilateral relationship. Thank you. Students uh, who are interested in 
studying the United States, I'll, I'll just say a few things. First, uh, you don't have to worry about visas anymore. Visas are very easy to get. 96% of Indonesians who are going to good, you know, any kind of recognized university are going to get a visa. And almost all of them will get a visa within five days of seeking employment. So it's very fast, it's very easy, and a very user friendly. You can go on our website and get all the information you know, about how to go about it. Secondly, we're doing a lot to try to um, develop mentorship programs so that graduates say you can be available to provide advice to other prospective students, talk a little bit about their experience uh, in the United States, and you know, answer any questions they have. We think that those of the Indonesian graduates are in many ways our best spokespeople, because all of them come back very enthusiastic about their experience in the United States. And they can answer questions about what it's like to be a Muslim in the United States, and you know, why Whatever, whatever question people have. And so we really appreciate that, what, what our alumni and mentors are doing. Third, we're bringing um, a lot of efforts to try to make the, the process as easy as possible, for example, by offering, for example, things like the GREs and other tests that you have to take in more cities around Indonesia. Uh, there's even some, some uh, programs now to subsidize the cost of those. Uh, but we always want some suggestions about how we can do even better. So if there are, you have suggestions about ways that we can further streamline and improve the system, we would be very glad to hear them. Send them directly to me. This is our highest responsibility, and we'll be glad to, to, to listen to your ideas. On the question of, of STEM, I'm so glad you, you asked that question because you know, our country's future competitive. Really, the laws around the development of STEM capabilities. And the United States, we often, we often we, we emphasize uh, STEM, particularly at the higher education levels. I think even we need to be better in that there's never, you can never do enough in that area. And I think in Indonesia, there, there, there's, still a long, there's still a lot of room for growth uh, on the STEM side, particularly with respect to women and making sure that women have. A lot of women in the crowd here. I hope that all of you will also uh, not be shy about pursuing STEM opportunities. Um, we are doing a lot to try to, to develop those opportunities. We have a special program for the U.S. Agency for International Development to develop research opportunities between American and Indonesian universities. So I encourage you to contact them. We can give you the, uh, the name of Mary Dolan after does this over the years, yeah. And as I say, we're particularly interested in trying to do more on STEM side because there are a lot of opportunities for Indonesia in the United States. But even more importantly, there are many Americans who would like to come here and do more in those fields. So there's a, there's a market and there's a you know, uh, financing for that kind of help. So there's a lot of great things. Thanks a lot for the question.
raise the, the tariffs, to raise the, the price of, of uh, geothermal energy, which makes it, gives it a greater incentive for American, American and other companies to do that. So we think that there's going to be a lot of uh, very, very good opportunities. Uh, our, our export import bank and other financiers are willing to finance geothermal projects. And as I say, they're very good because they're, they're renewable energy, projects will go on indefinitely in, in this country the ring of fire. So we think that there are tremendous opportunities to work out. Already several companies, as I said in my speech, have taken advantage of it, but we'd like to see much, much more. And it will help so much for, uh, for your energy security, but also
morning, Your Excellency. So, uh, my name is Iman and I'm, I'm a third year student of international relations, focusing more on the security studies. I am interested uh, in point two and five about the maritime and security cooperation. So, when we see uh, the, China's, uh, the rise of China in, in both political and also uh, economic uh, terms, so what, uh, how beneficial this maritime cooperation for the United States in balancing uh, the behavior, the policy toward uh, the China's policy towards the South China Sea, since the uh, United States doesn't have any military cooperation in terms of uh, foreign deployment uh, in, in, in Indonesia. Thank you. Indonesia's priorities are changing. For many years, you had your army, which was the largest and most significant part of the uh, Indonesian armed forces. But I think President Joko is now going to give greater emphasis to both the American, the Navy, and to the Air Force to, uh, again, help provide for your security of the future. And certainly, uh, he has placed great emphasis on ensuring maritime security and stopping illegal fishing within Indonesia's waters. Uh, and that, of course, is a very high priority for any country to do that. Uh, so we're glad to do more in terms of either training, in terms of exercises, in terms of equipment that perhaps we've already provided, for example, postal radars. But more will be needed to ensure that Indonesia is fully aware of all of the illegal fishing that's going on in all of the waters. We have two thirds of the country of water. So that's one thing. I think on the, on the question of China, as you said, um, it, it, it's not going to be so much a military response, it will be uh, a multilateral diplomatic response. So the focus of our efforts has been to uh, encourage ASEAN in, it, in its efforts to negotiate a code of conduct in the South China Sea. Susie, even Susie, when she opened, she talked about how Hillary Clinton and emphasized freedom of navigation and a peaceful resolution of disputes. And nowhere are those two priorities more important than in South China. Because a huge proportion of the world's trade passes through the South China Sea. And there are a number of territorial disputes in South China Sea. So it's extremely important that all countries be committed to the peaceful resolution of the uh, in accordance with international law. And again, we think that the ASEAN code of conduct is a very good way of resolving these And so we will strongly support that and we strongly welcome the steps that Indonesia in particular has taken to help forge that code. Thank you for that question. Uh, good morning everyone, uh, I'm Candy from Faculty of Law, University of Indonesia. Uh, I heard that U.S. has given many scholarships for Indonesian people who wanted to go for research, graduate programs, and so on. But the amount of them are less than Indonesian children who discontinue their education because of poverty and lack of facilities. As, an, as a representative of U.S. in Indonesia, I would like to know, is there any place of U.S. to develop the education of children in Indonesia? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, in terms of scholarship opportunities, as a, as a government, we don't provide scholarship opportunities because individual universities are generally the ones that provide scholarship, usually on a needs-based basis. So, for example, my university, Harvard University, they will, they will accept a candidate, regardless of what their financial ability is. And only after that did they then say, somebody really is very, very important, like a beautiful full scholarship. And many of the universities are like that. So, and you know, I encourage you, if you're thinking about a university, to, to be in direct touch with them. And even to negotiate with them. You can tell them that you know, you've gotten an offer from another school to get 
Uh, the other side of it, perhaps, that's maybe more challenge would be on climate change. Many of you saw that President Obama and President Xi of China announced an extremely important agreement uh, during the course of President Obama's bilateral visit to China last week. And they announced for the first time uh, a joint agreement on future climate change, or future greenhouse gas emissions reductions, for the first time covering emissions after 2020, uh, which, is very, which is very, very important, because up until now, the Chinese have not been willing to offer concrete targets. Uh, so this is the first time that China has ever done it. We really congratulate the Chinese and thank them for their leadership on this. But now, President, President Obama has to go back and get congressional approval. Because, as you know, our Congress is the one that, that provides money and the financing for all of these kinds of uh, agreements. So they have, through the power of the purse, as we say, the ability to perhaps control or even potentially uh, stop the agreement altogether. So one very, very important effort that will now have to take place will be for the administration to consult with both houses of Congress to hopefully gain their support in this very, very important agreement that has gone forward. The reason that some Republicans oppose climate change is that they come from uh, either states, for example, like Kentucky, Head of the Senate, the new head of the Senate is Mitch McConnell, so Senator from Kentucky, has a lot of control. So potentially, as part of an agreement, we will have to reduce substantially our reliance on coal and increase our reliance on renewable energy. And of course, that probably won't be very good for the state of Kentucky. So Mitch McConnell is going to oppose this agreement for that reason. So that gives you a sense of some of the both the local, regional, and national issues that have to be dealt with as part of any agreement. So those are maybe two examples of how the new Congress will, uh, will be working. But I think the most important thing to emphasize is just what President Dubois has been emphasizing for your part, and that's the need for everybody to work together. And if you could get everybody to work together and figure out, instead of emphasizing the differences, emphasize where your commonalities are and then do some, make some agreements that will benefit your people. So that's certainly what President Bill Police is going to try to do. And that's certainly what I think President Obama is going to try to do as well. And, uh, American people uh, very much want to see that out of their, out of their government. They're, they're tired of seeing a lot of arguing in the U.S. Congress and arguing between the administration and Congress. They want to see the results. So now the burden is on the administration of Congress to show the results. And that's good. Thank you for that question. Okay, thank you. My name is Gus Nulishnana from Physics Universitas Indonesia. Um, my expertise is geophysics, so I'm interested in... <laughs> Okay, so I am interested in your explanation about uh, geothermal collaboration. I have studied about uh, geothermal in Indonesia. My mini thesis is geothermal in Indonesia. And uh, I want to know about the percentage, uh, the percentage uh, of the success uh, of, uh, from the uh, collaboration geothermal uh, US uh, Indonesia. And I will be more happy if you want to tell me about the geothermal in the U.S. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that question. Most of all, thank you for not asking the physics question. <laughs> <laughs> that would have exploded my very poor knowledge of physics. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I have to say that geothermal is not as important an energy source in the United States because we just don't have the resources that we do. We don't have, uh, you know, you have the same stream of fire here that, that offers gigantic opportunities. We just don't have those same kinds of geological uh, uh, attributes that Indonesia does. But we do have some geothermal and certainly our companies are going to find. I will tell you that uh, Chevron, a very famous American company, 
has its largest geothermal operation in the world, in Indonesia and the Philippines. So that shows, in a way, the huge potential that exists here. Um, those, many of those facilities have been operating for many years when uh, global oil prices were much lower.
those reactional populations play a very, very important role in encouraging the members of Congress to pay attention to those countries, to approve more funds for them, to travel to those countries, and also play a very important role in financing things like Indian studies programs at local universities, and basically raising the profile of India and China. Your diaspora is quite small because It's a very nice country, and I want to come back to it. So we don't have as many dead people there, so we don't have that kind of civil society list that other countries are getting. So I think that is one of the challenges that we face to try to raise the profile of Indonesia in the United States. And that's why I mentioned the US Indonesia business council, the business council. That would be wonderful, not just for resolving some of the raising the profile of Indonesia in the American economy. So that's a very, very happy thing about that. You know, I'd say here in Indonesia, um, President Jokowi has really looked very strategically at what are the biggest challenges faced in Indonesia. And he's, he's working on all. He wants to develop, he wants to raise growth rates, he wants to do it in, in an inclusive way to do this. Hundred million or so are living in less than two dollars a day out of poverty. He wants to streamline decision making to make it easier for out of the Indians, but also foreign investors. He wants to address corruption. So, but those are the yeah, so Those are all very hard things to do. And so, you know, we wish him well. We want to support him in every way we can to help see him succeed. And maybe this is the way I'll conclude. Say. What President Obama told us is that we have a stake in the success of the Indonesian people. We want to see your country rise. We want to see your country become a great power. And that's what all of these programs are about, strengthening our cooperation, strengthening our relations. So we build on the common values and common interests that we have. And not only, again, provide for the security and the prosperity of our people, so that we can work together in the G20. We can work together to improve peacekeeping operations. We can work together to improve maritime security. We can work together to immunize nations. And I think the Indian has been playing an increasingly influential role in all of those institutions. And therefore, I think very much I'd like to develop that partnership. So again, I want to just thank everybody here for your lovely even more ways to get students from the University of Indonesia to come to the United States, either as graduate students or um, research partnerships of one sort or another. But we really strongly see you as not only future leaders, but also hopefully as future partners. So thank you all so much.
to uh, uh, for your generous time and giving lectures and knowledge to our students. Uh, we also have a token of appreciation from our university. You wanted to add some words? Just make one more comment about the additional money. First of all, I'm glad to come back to my own environment. But also, um, keep in mind that what we, I mentioned social media. We try to do a lot of things on social media. So I have Twitter press conferences and things like that pretty regularly. So please go on to our Twitter account at the US Embassy. You can just go to Google, you know, US Embassy Jakarta, and you'll see the Twitter account. And we'll announce those press conferences. And again, we try to do them about once a month now. So you're always welcome to join one of those and you know, ask any question you want. You don't have to be polite. Uh, we always, we always want to hear from you. So thank you. Thank you. So we'll be looking for the founder of Twitter after this because the founder of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, was here. So after this, maybe the founder of Twitter can also come to me. <laughs> okay. So we would like to invite uh, Professor Bambang Tumawarta to give a token of appreciation to our distinguished speaker for today, uh, Ambassador Blake.